Hello, I'm Elio Forcheron. And I'm Niniri Niri. And we're back, back to our old lore talk game. Hell yeah, it's been a while. Yes, you know how that whole life uh, and scheduling, you know, scheduling Savage becomes <laughs> the real challenge. <laughs> oh yes. So, today we are talking about the maritime nation of Limsa Laminsa. We are the Grand Thalassacre, the home of 14's degeneracy, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> See, I wasn't even thinking about leaping right into that, but that's definitely one way to do it. <laughs> Never have you seen such a hive of scum ability. Right. This will be us kind of uh, wrapping up our first three starting cities at this point, because we've hit on both Sildi, Ulda, Baladia, really. We've hit on Gelmora and Grudania. We have indeed. So this is our final. Obviously, this will not be our last. We'll probably be moving on to, what, maybe Ishgard, Alamigo, one of those good, good, good places. And then perhaps if people have a subject they specifically want to hear, like, I don't know, Alag, uh, we can hit on that. Yeah, I'd love to hear in the comments what you'll want, and we'll make notes of it, and, and we'll go back to that. Okay, with that out of the way, I have a question for you, Neneri. What is Limsa Lamitsa? Okay, so Limsa is, like I said, a thalassocracy, if I can get that word out properly. It, it's a naval power. Originally sort of a pirate haven, think Jamestown in the Golden Age of Piracy in the real world. But moving on, it gradually got more and more organized. The pirate crews got more centralized. They instituted more, I don't want to say rigorous democracy, but... Uh, as close to it as you can reasonably expect from pirates, which will later become compounded on greatly with Merlith. Yeah, if anything, I think it's at least a meritocracy, and the level to which it's a fair one can be even argued, but it gets better as it goes on? <laughs> yeah, it sort of gets more cohesive at the very least, and then when Merlith takes over it, it has an enormous leap forward in, I guess, equity probably isn't the right word, but it comes close enough for me. Yeah, and in recent days, like within the 7th Astral Era, it has been pushing definitely more progressively forwards. When was Limsa Lamenta founded, and slash how did Limsa Lamenta get founded? And I think this is going to be quite a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. Essentially, the origins of Limsa Lamenta can be found in Vikings, <laughs> which, you know, were pseudo a form of, of pirates in real life. A bunch of Rogadin from Air Slaint, from their homeland, left home after political upheaval, we'll say, and beached themselves on Vilbrand, which maybe isn't the best indication of their skill as pirates anyway. <laughs> well, to be fair, to be fair, the uh, people steering the boat were Elizans, so maybe that's on us. Fair point, fair point. On you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Lalafell problem, problem will come later. It will. It will. So they, they essentially abandon ship and they start to build the settlement there, this little cove, this hid pirate haven, I suppose. And it begins to grow from there. Uh, you know, more, more pirates come in, they grow, they eventually become an admiralty, so they have enough ships to, to muster a significant... Real quick, don't they first off, so they leave the boat, then they're like, oh, there's land and stuff, and then they come back to the boat because they get harassed by the kobolds before they build the settlement, and then they build bridges off of the ship, which becomes Limsa. Yeah, or at least inspires the architecture of Limsa. Yeah, there's a specific line that says, like, that's that's how Limsa gets born. Yes, no, that's absolutely the settlement that gets born, but, I, you know, I'm sure the, the bridges of modern Limsa are inspired by... The, the layout of modern Laminsa is inspired by this. But yeah, I mean, they were harassed by the kobolds. I'm not sure that the most reliable narrators in that sense. They maybe walked into kobold native land with axes in hand and did some stuff and got harassed back, which is a through line that you will see repeatedly in this subject. Yes, it's 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 definitely a back and forth. And how much you want to just say they're pure instigators, you can debate, but they definitely are instigators. <laughs> they are at least a little bit instigators. They did some instigating. So, where is Limsa Laminsa? So, Limsa Laminsa seems to be, from what I can see at least, all over the coastline of Vilbrand. They seem to have a pretty solid control, probably not a ubiquitous control, but a pretty solid control over the coastline of Vilbrand. 
Would you say at the very least the southern half, seeing as with the northern half is more cobalt control? The southern half of Vilbrand is usually known as Linosia, the northern half Ogomoro. Definitely the southern half is their their core sort of stronghold. But I wonder if the northern coast are still somewhat limits and and the specifically the inland, the northern inland is Ogomoro. Mm -hmm. I mean that would make somewhat sense, right? Because you the northern half touches on both the Indigo Deep and the Strait of Merlothor, where the, the Limitsons don't exactly have super control over the Indigo Deep, one, because it's vast, and two, because of the Sahagan territory, but clearly, at least to an extent, like the area near Vilbrin. So, yeah, that, that would track. Yeah, at least to a certain degree. And yes, yeah, so, so essentially, it's it's confined to Vilbrin, although we do see them beginning to expand it to some of the surrounding islands, the Sea Ladies, and stuff like that. Yeah, which will be fun to talk about later as we get into their relevance for Island Sanctuary. We, it's funny because we had been mentioning them and talking about them for, for years. It's like, oh, this is, these are little interesting islands. And then when they started mentioning Island Sanctuary, it was like, okay, there's two possibilities. It's either the Cialdes or it's it's like something in the bounty. Right, exactly. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the various things that we get into there with um, Miss Beard. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we'll definitely be talking about Miss Beard as we go on through the history of Limsa. It's a realm defined kind of by its seas, essentially. And we'll go on also to have some relevance as a mineral supply HQ as it starts to gain influence in the inland as well. And, you know, with its craftsmen and stuff like that. But more, moreover, it is defined by its contact with the seas and the, the trade networks, both by trading on them and by predating on them. Before we move on to the piracy, uh, let's talk a bit more about the geography, just in case anyone's unaware. So you have Vilbrand, which is the island that mixed with Aldenard, the main continent, makes up Eorzea. You've got Lenosia itself, which is effectively the southern half, cut in half by the mountain, Ugamoro, and then the northern section, which is Ogomoro, which we haven't seen since basically the 1.0 trailer. It's kobold land and it's wild country. You then have the Rotano Sea, which is to the south of Vilbrand. You've got the Strait of Merlthor, which is to its east. It's the strait between Aldenard and Vilbrand. And then you have the Indigo Deep to its west, which is the large ocean. It's effectively the Pacific, primarily populated by Sahagan. There may be many other things besides, as it's a vast amount of water, but we just don't really know. On the other side of the Indigo Deep, obviously, is the New World, which will come up later in this conversation, but... Yeah, that, that, that overall geography should give people a baseline to understand kind of some of the conversation going forward. Right, and we should note they would have arrived via the Indigo, Indigo Deep, via the Bloodbrine down to the Indigo Deep from Airslaint, which is the, the frigid northern home of their of the Seawolf uh, subrace. The, of course, one of the most important parts of the geography I forget, which is what's to the north. The Also to the south of the Cialides, which if you've done Island Sanctuary, you know where that is. And then beyond that, I guess further south, you're talking about the South Sea Isles, that, then I guess that'll also be relevant. Oh uh, yeah, I mean they're, they're certainly relevant via the Lalafell via Nim. Yes, yeah, very much so. So, who are the peoples of Limsa Lamensa? Like, what are their population and makeup? And then I guess secondly, after that, maybe more broadly, who are the peoples of Vilbrand? Right. So Limsa Lamensa is a vastly diverse realm, as you would imagine from a, a trading hub, as you would imagine from sort of an island state of this nature in its position. Obviously, the most iconic and the most dominant for a lot of the history, I think it's more arguable now, peoples of the city would be the Seawolf, Rogadin, who settled the city. But they're not the only ones there. The Plainsfolk are an enormous factor. They make up, is it almost a quarter of the city? Yeah, they make up like 20%, so pretty huge chunk. Yeah, a huge chunk. And they are responsible for a lot of the mercantile bent to limits so that's you know growing over time yeah it's it, what's interesting about limpsa's makeup is like in current times i mean from encyclopedia eorzea we get sea wolf roganins are almost fully half like something like 40 percent uh, seeker of the suns are about as much as the plains folk midlander are about 10 percent and then there's other which is 10 percent What's interesting about that to me is that in the historical annals we know that there were elizin on the gladian when it ran aground we know that we have people like Carvalin. Elizin have a weirdly important role at certain key moments, but are not really representative in population's makeup. Yeah, which does make sense, right? Coerthus, of course, is 
not particularly far from Vilbrand. It's just over the Strait of Milthor that there are some rivers that connect it. And then down in the south, it's separated by your fame, which nobody wants to walk through. <laughs> it's definitely close enough. That's, what, of course, where Kavalin is from. He is Ishgardian. But yeah, the, the sheer fact that so many ships go through Vilbrand, it makes sense that you can basically find any race within reason within Vilbrand. At least some levels, I would assume. The Secret of the Suns are interesting. Obviously, they, they don't have an enormous impact on the culture, unlike the Lalafells and the Seawolves, it seems to me. No, it's true. And I also say, if you want to know more about Euphame, go check out our previous lore talks, for, such as the ones on Mach. But the thing that's interesting about that is, where do I almost Secret of the Suns have a huge impact on culture? Because even in, you know, Alamigo, with the tribes, in no place do they seem singularly to heavily impact the culture it seems more defined by the other races not that they're not an incredibly important part of civilizations and nations but they always tend to like set themselves a little bit aside although i do love the justification that the lore gives for why they tend to flock towards limps and that's just because it's sunny and it's nice <laughs> who wouldn't want to go yeah i think it's also stated somewhere that they like being pirates <laughs> yeah. which is okay i mean fine yeah, the only place that I can think of that is definitively Secret of the Sun in, in sort of culture and character would be the Sigourney Desert, right? Right. Uh, and they're very small numbers there. Right, and even there, it's the U tribe. And the U tribe's very similar to the M tribe, right? In terms of, okay, they have an important population area, but still, they're not a part of any of the singular nations. Even though the, the U tribe is incredibly important in the Sigourney Desert to Ulda, it's still set apart from Ulda. Yeah, definitely. I, and I think the Keepers of the Moon, at least previously, marginalized groups in Gridania, etc. It, it, it all seems to point to the fact that the Makote are not cultural juggernauts in this region, which could be because of their El Sabadi in exile, of course. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So we've talked about the Lamincens people, but what about the other people who live within Vilbrand? Like the Kobolds or the, well, I guess the Hoggins is, they don't too much live within Vilbrand for the most part. They kind of do, but it's mostly they come just to have spawning grounds. But Right, well, we should talk about them, right? I mean, they're, they're major parts of the story, at least. So just to quickly touch on the Sahagin, they are essentially refugees. They're fleeing the effects of the calamity, which has destroyed their native spawning grounds. They don't live on land. They live deep in the oceans with their queen, who you saw a reflection of in the first and killed. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the uh, one in Amnesis and Niter, not the, uh, the versus the one in Ando Cups, which we more help with. Yeah, exactly. There's also the one in the Roll Quest, obviously, for Endwalker. So, yeah, they're fleeing, they're destroyed, spawning grounds, they're trying to gather some on the coast of Limsa quite aggressively, and the Limsums have never been great with sharing space. So, they, which, you know, makes sense. Uh, Vilrand is not an easy place to live, even with the expanded farming efforts that we see post-calamity. It's not a hugely self-sufficient island, at least in the hands of these new inhabitants, these centuries old but still newer than Nim inhabitants. Yeah, and I, and I, this will be relevant with the kobolds as well, but it's really worth emphasizing this because it's such an important theme of uh, Realm Reborn to Endwalker that this isn't just like a side quest thing. The MSQ is like, this is one of the primary arcs, but the relationship between the tribal groups and the Aorzian races, or whatever terminology you want to use, is always been way more complicated and way more supportive throughout history. It's not been always been adversarial. Like, originally, the Sahagans actually were able to work with a lot of the people of Limsa. You also had Nim and Kobolds got along really, really well, which we have touched on in our episode about Nim. Yeah, absolutely. So, as much as it can seem, if you're only looking at the lore of, like, the past 20 years, seem very fatalistic about, like, oh, there's always going to be conflict between these groups. It, there's long swaths of history that show that that's just not required. You know, it'd be like saying, oh, you know, Lalafels and Roganins are doomed to battle eternally. <laughs> maybe we are, maybe we are. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, um, like you said, the Kobolds have an extensive period of collaboration with Nim. They even have treaties signed with Limsa that hold up for some time at least. Even the Uldans have treaties and, uh, and collaborations with their neighbors. Yeah. So what about the Kobolds though? So the Kobolds are an interesting case study. They're this intended to be meritocratic, but sort of oligarchic civilization that lives up in the mountains. I, I get the impression that they were more meritocratic before the influence of the Asians and of Titan. 
indirectly Titan, seem to have corrupted it by creating this clergy that is, well, not creating the clergy, but maybe corrupting the clergy and, and creating this horrible authoritarian state. But they're um, hugely industrious, massively skilled blacksmiths and armorers. They're very skilled with bomb making, with mining. They live largely underground inside mountain is had specifically Ogomoro. Uh, we get the impression that there's an enormous city in there, actually. Can I just take a side tangent one moment to curse whoever decided the idea that Ugomoro and Ogomoro were going to be the names? Because it is <laughs> very hard to like, to like, not only remember which is which, but to delineate in speech which one is meant. Oh, I just throw it at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, you're going to win 50% of the time. That's true. But yeah, so the kobolds like I said, they jostle against them, sir, and they seem okay with living with with just controlling Ogomoro and its surrounding territories. But the Limpsons put pressure on them. They want some of that mineral wealth for themselves. The Kobolds aren't entirely blameless in this, of course, and the Asians are enormously to blame for this. But they have deep civil strife. They they, they go to war uh, multiple times. They sign treaties multiple times that break down. We, we sort of get the impression that maybe the Limpsons are responsible for more of those breakdowns than the Kobolds are. But again, the meddling of the Asians muddles the whole thing. As does it in all of history. Okay, so let's talk about government and religion. Well, why not start with government? What is the government of Limsa Limsa? So the government is pretty centralized. It seems somewhat autocratic in that the, the ruling individual, the admiral, will assign the councillors of state single-handedly. The advisors and the council are assigned by the admiral at the time. But the admiral has to win their seat by taking part in the Trident, which is a multi-pirate crew contest where the strongest makes it out to rule the city. And it's supposed to happen every seven years. However, the calamity and recent events have thrown a things into a little bit of a wiggly-woggly whoop. They have, they have. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we all appreciate Melbourne being in control there, as much as the centralization of power may be somewhat uh, antithetical to the ethos of the city. To be honest, it doesn't sound like the system was working great. It's mentioned that every time a new admiral comes into power, they have their own ideas, and which is fine, but they just completely overhaul the policies and the politics and the administration of the city, which you would imagine is not the best setup for a lasting profitability and prosperity or stability. Yeah, and it, it also has evolved because the Trident has existed for a couple hundred years. There was more of just the Admiralty being passed down by selection beforehand, but effectively the general gist of the rulership has been the same for all limits in history. Yeah, basically the lineage of Admirals has been passed down since the city was first founded when Elil Wayne takes over. And the, the, like you said, it is in large part passed down by selection for the first few Admirals, we get the impression, but eventually to avoid civil war, this trident system was invented. Yeah, by uh, Agatsar Romerlson. And the only reason I'm saying that name is because I had to say it, I think, 20,000 times during my recording for the Rogadin racial lore video I did. <laughs> so it stuck <laughs> permanently in my head. The other thing I'll say is that I would remind people for these things, these lore talks are meant more as primer and deep dive to get you into it. We don't necessarily hit on every single piece of every facet of everything you could possibly learn. So see this more as a starting place. And if you also want to learn more about some of the things that we touch on, we have a lot of racial videos, video lore talks on other things like Nim and elsewhere. So I would recommend watching those or engaging yourself within Encyclopedia Eorzea Volumes 1 and 2, because now they are readily and widely available. Or, you know, within the game itself. Yeah, definitely. So what about religion? Because on the one hand, it's a relatively deep topic in terms of importance to them. But in, in a sense, there's actually religion is pretty not superficial, but it's not dogmatic or highly organized within Lamensa. Right. The Limpsons are, I'm, I'm not going to say anarchic because they're not, not nowadays anyway, but they are uh, <laughs> a libertarian. Maybe isn't the right <laughs> word. But... It's not wrong. It's not wrong. They, they do not like overarching power structures. They're, they're not big fans of governmental power or uh, that kind of body. The nation of pirates are not fair of regu <laughs> regulatory bodies. <laughs> <laughs> what? what madness. No, no. Believe it or not. So they don't really have a clergy. They have a patron goddess. They have Limlaine, the navigator, the 
obvious choice, of course, the goddess of, well, uh, uh, of the exact kind of things that Limsa would like, you know, seafaring, the ocean, stuff like that, navigation. Making sure wind gets in the sails. Yeah, definitely useful. You know, you, you can only carry so many wind crystals to throw up there. <laughs> yeah, so Sydney worship her. She's pretty ubiquitously worshipped. Her, her, her faith is dominant, extremely dominant. But she doesn't really have an organized clergy. It seems very personalized. You know, everyone does their own business. There's no, there's no codified dogma outside of that which Charlian publishes, which I'm sure is influential on the island. It, it shapes our entire understanding of the Twelve as a faith. But I'm sure they're not following any religious councils with massive adherence from Charlian. Yeah. Interesting, you know, when you think about going to the other historical bodies that have existed on uh, Vilbrand, like Nim, and how their worship of Oshan seemed far more codified. You think about the Wanderer's Palace, right? I don't think there's anything necessarily to take away as a juxtaposition between those cultures, but it is interesting at the same time how things like the Maelstorm get our venerations of things that Nim did, which I guess, since we were talking about governments, we should also hit on their mil military body with the Maelstorms. Right, exactly. The, the Maelstrom is their grand company, right? It's named for Operation Maelstrom, which was uh, an operation to protect Nim using scholarly magics, using sort of ethereal manipulation and equations. If you don't mind, I am going to just take a second to deepen a little bit just because it's one of my favorite stories in 14, which is just that it was basically a bunch of the scholars and other magic users of Nim going, we can't save everyone from the floods of the Sixth Astral Calamity, but we can buy them time and sacrifice themselves to cast a magic spell to physically hold back the waves of an Umbral Calamity long enough for everyone to get to high ground. And fuck, man, that gets me emotional. It's really cool. I, I love the idea of just looking down from this bird's eye view and seeing mathematical equations being carved out in, in Aether on the sea. It's just a really cool idea. Oh, mm, okay, I'm, mm, deeply have I ever wished and wanted for, look, e Echo Vision going into the fifth astral era or something to like do that. Or hey, War of the Magi Ultimate, I'm just saying. <laughs> that, that's my like tinfoil <laughs> dream upon a dream. But then again, we did get variant dungeons with Sildi. So at this point, anything's game. We can do it. I believe in us. <laughs> I'll, I'll take any uh, any law revolving around the era that I can get. Finding out more about Scala as your primal, you just will it into existence. I really do. But yeah, so the, the Maelstrom is a, a fairly recent invention. Belwib invented it. You know, she took on uh, Agatha. I'm just going <laughs> to let you correct me on that. Um, she took his, his example where he formed a pirate code to, well, he illegally assassinated someone, then took on a pirate code. The Lamentson Way! <laughs> yeah. To settle the state less than 100 years after its founding. And she brought together the crews, founded this order of naval warriors, let's say, and gave herself <laughs> unilateral powers to command all ships in Lamentson waters. Not only the pirate crews, but also merchant companies, which is thinking about the Luminson character, it just tells you, number one, how extraordinary the Galleon threat was, and number two, how powerful a person Merlwood was to not get assassinated or have the city ripped apart by civil war immediately. Yeah. No, I, and, and I actually, we'll probably, we're going to talk about Merlwood more, but one thing I just want to touch on too is the iconography of the Fermil Storm, which is the red banner, but with the sort of Viking ship, which is supposed to be a nod to the Sea Wolves, the Gladian, and, and also basically the accords that Merlin makes in order to kind of end piracy is called the Gladian Accords, obviously named after the Gladian. One of the other interesting things up to me, though, about the Maelstrom is that they don't have a lot in terms of actual soldiers. It's basically all ships. Like, they're, they're, they're just a navy, which, I mean, makes sense for them. That's the most useful thing. But it is interesting when you think about ever having to engage with people outside of their strong suit with the sea puts them at a disadvantage, which you do see a couple of times uh, if you talk to different Maelstrom members at places in which they've joined the Eorzean Alliance. They'll, a lot of times they'll talk about what is this nightmare in terms of the temperature of places like Garlemald. Yeah, they are not a formal military. Well, they kind of are, but they're not well suited to it necessarily, you know, and it makes sense, right? Limsa is a very decentralized state. So sure, 
if you invade Vilbrand, you're not going to be able to hold it. You don't have the food. It's not fertile enough for someone to hold it without significant investment. And you might raise Limsa and kill the Admiral, but because it's so decentralized, they're just going to reform up, hold a new trident, get a new Admiral, and be back at it the moment you leave their shores. So they didn't need a defense force per se, not to mention the stressors that war with Limsa would put on the trade routes for the entire continent. So it, they didn't need legions of soldiers to protect themselves. They they had their crews, they had people on board who could fight that would later become pseudo-marines, let's say, and that's all they needed. Yeah. So, uh, heading back to Merlewib, why don't we talk about some of her accomplishments, and even though that we're kind of starting more towards the end with current times with her, I think there's so much to talk around her that it, it is a good place to get going from. Yeah, I mean, Merlewib's accomplishments might be the most profound out of any of the the main leaders, perhaps not counting Raban. She is a major component in the discovery of the new world or the discovery of safe passage, safe in finger brackets, to the <laughs> new world, because previously it was extraordinarily unreliable. It's now only a little bit unreliable. She's described as having won naval wars against the nations of air slant, whatever they may be. Well, obviously, she defeated her father in single combat and took control of his pirate confederacy, the Lost Bastards. If you'd like to know more about that story, you can also go read the, I believe, one of the Endwalker short stories that details that event. Yes, yes, absolutely. And also, one of the requests from Endwalkers is integral to learn more about Melwip. Yes. I mean, the thing is, is whether you like or don't like Laments' general air and, and way of doing things, she is a, a paragon of not only what Limsa's best can be, but also charting a way forward. And I think that's also why her story is one of the probably more interesting ones for the leaders, because her path can go from incredibly pragmatic utilitarian, but also, so, also idealistic, to charting a way forward that's better, not just in a relationship with the tribal groups, but for the whole of her people, and to make a future that can last in that piece is to me really really compelling absolutely she's my favorite national leader out of the uh, the main leaders at least and it's interesting it's sort of implied that despite how you would imagine the pirate leader of limsa limits to be power hungry it's kind of implied that she doesn't really like her job very much and that the only way she gets through it because she can't sail anymore is by getting drunk. <laughs> yeah, she's, what is it, Lomani Red? She loved, uh, the one of the only things you get is that outside of doing her job, because she doesn't get to sail as much due to being the Admiral, she drinks a lot of wine. <laughs> Which I respect. <laughs> Definitely can get behind. But yeah, I, she, she's a fascinating character both in, in current history, but also in, in past history as well. And probably will go on to be very central in the mythology of whatever future Limsa Lomensa has oh I, absolutely i would imagine so i could imagine her going down as like slayer of mistbeard uniter of limsa uh, yeah she, she's definitely a a legendary figure in the making there's the other pirate groups too you've got the bloody executioners the kraken's arms and the sanguine sirens foremost among them we, you know we already mentioned carvalin hilfir actually comes up in the msq who leads the bloody executioners and i love how lore set up for him in ee1 in what 2016 or something ends up being relevant to the msq in 5.x <laughs> yeah it's excellent the bloody executioners are the most powerful of the individual crews the league of lost bastards in the united form were probably stronger than them before they were folded into the maelstrom more completely but they you know they almost rebelled against Melwib. they're very powerful the kraken's arms are the slightly more Eastern trade oriented group with Kavalain at their head, I believe. And then the Sanguine Sirens are like a mood. A mood. A mood. <laughs> they, they only accept female sailors and they're very violent and very sort of, well, very charming. I, I do like them. I like all of the crews, actually. Uh, I, I like Kavalain a lot as a character as well. Yeah. Yeah, he, he has a very interesting backstory, which we've nodded at some, but I highly recommend you look up any of the quests kind of involving him, or also, he actually he even nod at this during the MSQ when you're going to Othard for the first time. Roswin is also interesting because she was at the Battle of Cartnow. She's referenced in Merlib's short story. But beyond that, 
I highly recommend you go to the missing member, which is the Sanguine Sirens area, and just look at some of the uh, background NPC dialogue. Let's just say there's some, there's some, there's some doozies. Well, you only really need to look at the name of the, of the area, <laughs> right? <laughs> Fair enough. Since we're talking about groups in Limsa, we should also talk about groups like the Marauders, the Arcanists, and the Rogues Guild. You got the Rogues Guild, which came out of the Upright Thieves, which is a historical group, and then you have Arcanism, which comes about mainly because of the Plainsfolk Lollafell, and then Marauders, kind of because of pirates, but also a little bit in a nod to Nim. Right, exactly. I think the Marauders are a somewhat inevitable group. Maybe not axe-wise. Certainly their axes seem to be I mean, bill hooks and axes are very useful weapons to have on ships, but there seems to be some allusion, perhaps, to the Marauders of, and certainly in the name of Nim. And of course, they're folded in somewhat with the Yellow Jackets, who are now the policing force of Limsa, but were previously a military arm of that in their own right. The Arcanist arts are an Aboriginal practice of the South Sea Isles of the Plainsfolk tribes. Well, they carry on throughout much of. Lalafell and society in general, but yes, they seem to have their root in the in the plainsfolk culture, and and they seem to have developed this mathematical magical art there, and have brought it to the Isles, which of course makes sense because it was a huge part of Nim, and we do know that presumably they fled back to the South Sea Isles as well as Sanolin after the calamity, the Nimians, and like you said, the Rogue Guild are this pseudo-secret police um, uh, that have <laughs> formed within the city outside of that, that that guild of upright thieves that you mentioned. Yeah, I, and they all end up playing really interesting integrated roles. I, I guess oh, really this is true of all the city-states. When you look at the guilds, they actually play really interesting integrated roles, both culturally and also narratively. But it's really fascinating to me the way to which especially something like the Rogues Guild, is really deeply tied into the specific legacy and history of, of Limsa. Like, again, like, that's true of archers. It's true of lancers, but I don't know. There's something about, maybe it's just because of Ishikawa's writing with the Rogues Guild. It feels very flavorful. Yeah, it does. It definitely does. I, I think that extends to the Crafters Guilds as well. The armorers and the blacksmiths got their origin both in trade with the kobolds and profiteering from kobold territories and in shipbuilding you know that they have their origins as shipwrights which makes huge amounts of sense the culinarians are a little bit more recent it seems they're a bunch of people who said wow food on ship really sucks let's make it not the case <laughs> and then the fishermen guilds oh, how could one live on limsa limsa and not fish <laughs> So, speaking of, I guess, you know, culinarian, what sort of cuisine do we find in Limsa Limensa in general? And, and I guess Vilbrin as a whole. So, we don't know a great deal about kobold uh, or sahagin cuisine, but in terms of Limsa itself as a cultural entity, of course, the food is diverse, as you would expect, but huge amounts of seafood. They have a great deal of fresh produce available. They have vices from the east. They have wines from all across the world. So you can find probably any food in Limsa Liminsa, but, you know, hard alcohol, seafood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, 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 that tracks. So we've talked a lot about current Limsa, but why don't we rewind a bit and talk more about some of the past events, both in its initial founding and how we get where we are. Because I think loosely you can categorize it as a couple things, right? First, you have Gladian comes from Airslane ends up in where Gladium Bay is now, ends up becoming Limsa Liminsa because people come out, Kobolds harass, they go back in, and then basically the next bit of time is pretty much just defined by them becoming pirates and conflict with the locals. Yeah, I think sort of uh, the beginnings of what could be called centralization, I suppose. Well, one of the first questions I have is, the Nimians purportedly had really great relationship with the Kobold. Why do you think the Lamincins were unable to have that same shared interaction? So the, the rationale that the game points out to us is that they shared a religious affinity. So the Nimians who were deeply more religious, or at least more organized in their religion than the Lamincins, were dedicated to Oshan, who is a god of mountains, specifically. Now, of course, the Kobolds worship... Yugomoro, a titan, the mountain god of the volcano. So this religious sensibility, as well as perhaps the more 
peaceful nature of the Nimians. They weren't really interested in warfare. They didn't want to get involved in the War of the Magi, it seems. So they just seemed like a more peaceable people with this significant religious connectivity that allowed them to interface more with them. You know, it could be as simple in the case of Limsa failing to. It could be as simple as the initial landing. Think about the the Vikings under, well, various settlers landing in North America and having various conflicts with the indigenous Americans and being driven off. These things can be traced back to a misunderstanding or a, a hasty action. But I think also the underlying character of the cultures is somewhat responsible. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. And I think you can even see that in Nim with the way in which Nim wasn't one of the parties really engaging with the War of the Magi, that they were, if not more peaceful, at least more willing to just be even keeled with the people around them. Whereas Limsa has always been a vibrant bunch of folks. Right. We also get the impression that Nim is a monarchy. Now, the Tumbri King was not the monarch. That's a whole other thing that we go into in the Nim law talk. But this sort of strong affinity for authoritarian government would probably vibe pretty well with the kobolds and vice versa. Whereas the Luminsons hate authoritarianism, despite kind of falling into it a little bit nowadays. And the kobolds, especially as we see them nowadays, are immensely tyrannical. So that would probably just cause sort of an ideological friction. Yeah. And again, like we reiterated earlier, but, you know, when, when Agatzar Romerlson kind of pulls everyone together for the first time in, like, a couple decades after Limsa comes to be, you have him attempting to try to make good with the kobolds. There is multiple people throughout history who figure out, hey, this can't go on for forever. This At some point, the wheel, we got to break the wheel, otherwise it's just going to keep turning and people are just going to keep suffering. And you see honest attempts towards making peace. So he tries to do that. And then eventually there's new conflict that happens because of some people wanting wood or resources or what have you. And it's just kind of repetition of this back and forth. And now you may look at that and then be like, ah, crap, we're screwed. We're making a piece right now in Eorzea contemporarily. But, you know, how long will that last? But the whole point is it can last as long or as short as you're willing to put in the effort to make it. Right. And I think it makes a lot of sense that Agatzar specifically would be the one to reach out. He is the one who institutes the centralized government policies in so much as they can be called that. It's also implied somewhat that Limsa was a slave trading hub in that time. Well, it's, he outlawed it. So the fact that it gets outlawed specifically to me kind of notes that it needed to be outlawed. Yes, absolutely. So he's probably not quite as not quite as anarchic as the rest of his colleagues. So the, that's maybe an interesting angle as well. But like you said, that there are multiple treaties signed. People try on both sides to make peace. But unfortunately, until very recently, it did not hold up for a, a massive amount of time, at least. Yeah, and, and the real thing that basically gets everyone over and over again is expansionism and resources. Frankly, like the big thing that causes conflict with the kobolds and over and over again is just we ran out of lumber because we were not practicing sustainable practices and we moved north and then move into kobold lands and and then there's conflict. I guess if any of what we've said is interesting, I would go replay or play for the first time the patch 5.4 as pretty much everything we're talking about is either not necessarily just laid out there, but being nodded to or referenced, even if obliquely, throughout that entire patch. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. It's a bit of a shame that the Kobold questline, although very, very good, I love all of the Beast Tribe, again, finger brackets, questlines, and would encourage you to go play them. They're great content. The Kobold one provides interesting details on Kobold's social structure and crafting. It doesn't give an amazing picture of Limson Kobold relations, historically speaking. No, that is why I'm thankful we do have something like 5.4, though, because so much, so much effort is on display of trying to convey the historical context of that right absolutely so sometimes there are patches that just really reward you for knowing more about the world and it's not just like a, oh if you know lore you'll get this but they do a great job of explaining if you have no idea what they're talking about but if you do it makes the world feel so contiguous yeah they're good at explaining or hinting to the nature of things except for the heart of Sabiq. I don't know what you're talking about they've completely explained that have they no, no, they have not, and they never will. <laughs> oh, goddammit, don't gaslight me. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I also, you know, ironies upon ironies, shortly after they first make peace with the kobolds, they end up having problems with Sahagin, and then once they kind of solve that, they end up having the colonizing kobold lands issue again, 
And then it's kind of a back and forth for the better part of, you know, the next couple hundred years. You go into the golden age of piracy. That's when you get Mistbeard showing up, which is an interesting historical figure. You want to you explain Mistbeard real quick? Right. So Mistbeard is a collection of historical figures. It's a title that is somewhat passed down and is essentially an infamous pirate, a, a powerful pirate of the time who leads a significantly powerful crew. Sometimes it seems multiple crews, you know, sort of his own little fleet, his own little league. Oh, I suppose I shouldn't say little. The most powerful league at many points of Flimsa. They plunder the Uldan royal treasury. They settle the sea ladies in certain parts. They go toe-to-toe with Merlwib when, when she first takes over. But at the current time, the position is vacant because, of course, Grand Storm Marshal, the man on the ground who runs the Maelstrom, is the former Mistbeard. And after having been persuaded to give that up, except for a few fan service moments when he puts it on and gives us a good beating, he doesn't pass it on. He, he no longer agrees with the ideology. He's become a believer in Bill Whibb's sort of nationalist sentiment. And I, I don't necessarily mean nationalist in a negative sense there, but of course it is nationalist. She is forming a nation where previously there was only a very loose definition of one. Yeah, in a more charitable light, the sentiment towards unification, right? Of towards working together rather than antagonistically taking what the strong can from each other. Right. I, I suppose I mean nationalist in the sense that sort of historians use to regard the Renaissance states, where it becomes less of an individual who holds together a group of people to the idea of a nation. And it's always about, as we see with, you know, limits in history, it's always about how it gets used. And also excess. Excess can be the problem. So I guess we're getting closer and closer to current times. I mean, for the most part, it's a lot of the stuff that we talk about gets founded, guilds, all that sort of stuff. But about 80-ish years ago, little, little less, you get to one of my favorite stories, which is Kenton Ram the Blue traveling the world, travels to the new world, finds it, and tries to name it Kenton Land, and everyone's like, no. <laughs> yes. It's What's really interesting about that is the... That's like basically the first time people are really engaging with the new world. The new world... And its history and legacy with Eorzea and the Three Great Consonants. Well, I guess we don't really know how much Othard or Hingashi might have been engaging with them. But it's really ambiguous and very short-lived. Even just the foodstuffs that we have now that come from there have only existed on Eorzea for the better part of 100 years. And also, I mean, if you haven't been aware of this yet, if you think of Eorzea as Western Europe, Ilsebard as Eastern Europe, Othard as Asia... Hingashi as effectively Japan, I guess kind of also Doma, but... And then the New World as Americas. Look, I'm not saying that they kind of one to one it, because they didn't one to one it, but they kind of, like, really made it... It's very much that. And then also Mara City is Australia. Yes. Yes, Mara City is Australia. It's, so it's an interesting one, right? That that context is really interesting, because Eorzea uh, and, you know, Ilsebard and parts of Othard are a cultural melange, so... Eorzea is certainly geographically and maybe historically context-wise, as then in full Western Europe. It's also, you know, Gridania is somewhat Japan-themed. Uldar is, of course, somewhat West Asian, Middle Eastern themed. So, like... It's never one-to-one. No, it's never one-to-one. This game doesn't do one-to-ones. To think, actually. Um... <laughs> I only mean that really more in geographically, because culturally, I think as much as you can look at something like Hingashi and be like, okay, it's literally just Meiji Japan, right? Even Doma is a good example. It's a confluence of Japan and Korea and China. Like, it's it's never so simple. No, no, it's, it's never or very, very rarely that simple. So many people that I talk to think that Gridania is like Druidic Britain and that, yeah, there are parts of that. They're not wrong. Yeah, it, it's also Shinto Japan. If I can put in official terms, it's Shinto as hell, because it's so, there's so much Shintoism in it. There's a hell of a lot of Shintoism in it. If you if you know who Anonymous is, don't don't get him talking on that. He will uh, he will go off about Shinto in Kuritania. <laughs> but yes, the New World is really interesting. So so this is the first we hear in historical record of the New World. But we do have an implication that Alec got there. We, we find a Mamul jar in Crystal Tower, which makes sense. You know, they had spaceships. How could they not? Yeah. But for our purposes, until we get there, until we find out the implications of that, yes, Kenton Ram and the, the sort of cultural sphere of Limsa are the ones who find a way to get to the New World and discover the New World. Well, 
discover, you know, native people living there already. But you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll engage with it, I'm sure, at some point. I'm not thinking 7.0. I'm pretty sure 7.0 is going to be Maricidia, but at some point. Go in there. Yeah, we, we, we'd be going there. Continuing on from that, you get to basically this current century, right? And then so you have Blimensons and Kobolds trying to sue for peace again. And failing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, the, the treaty signed but so vaguely worded that it ends up just causing future conflict. This is it, especially this example, I think, is when you get um, certain kobolds will reference how Limonsons are betrayers. And it's especially within lifetime, current lifetimes, that kobolds are so hurt. And just like, why would they trust them again? Yeah, I think it's it's, it's hard not to imagine parallels are drawn between uh, Native American treaties. Definitely a lot of real life parallels being drawn there. Oh, if you want to watch geography, comment that you would or be interested in geography videos, because the couple of times that I have done some for maps, people have been, let's say, more or less interested in them, but definitely could do, could do more of those. You have about 40 some years ago, Merle Webb was born. And then basically it's kind of the history of Merle Webb, <laughs> frankly, for, for the better part of the next couple of decades. Up until basically Kobold start summoning their Titan, you got Leviathan comes to the fore, and it's basically just conflict with the tribal groups for a long time. It's worth pointing out that like the term beast tribe up to this point doesn't exist. It's only when Uldah passes it into law only 30 some years ago that then it's adopted by people like Merlwib and other Lemonsons and Gridanians. Basically, there's pre-existing umbrage there, and then there's a group that's like, hey, we've got a codified way to treat them as other, and everyone's like, that might be useful. Uh, yeah, I mean, think about it, right? Merwib State is founded on trade with Uldar, it's, as well as the East and Razahan, but trade with Uldar is a life. Without it, Limsa will fail under Merwib's policy because they can't do piracy anymore, so... They have a, a very real, and this does not excuse what they did, they have a very real incentive to follow the Uldan line on this. Uh, and of course, it was Uldan merchants specifically, the syndicate and merchants underneath them, who came up with this policy of labeling people <laughs> as beast tribes. Because they're just, they're, there's no historical difference to the various Eorzean races, for want of a better word. No, and we again, we have a video talking about that, but this, this is something that the game has been very, very clear on, even as early as ARR, and each patch and expansion after ARR has only gone to further clarify that the notion that there's a difference between Beast Tribe and Tribal Group is just... It doesn't make sense. If it's about language, it doesn't make sense. If it's about culture, it doesn't make sense. If it's about physiology, it doesn't make sense, because why would Al-Ra be but not? The game has done everything to make that clearer and clearer and clearer up until around Shadowbringers and Walker, especially, because Shadowbringers kind of puts the nail in the coffin of being, Hey, notice that dwarves are considered a tribal group. I wonder if that <laughs> could be telling of something. Yeah, I mean, E1, or two, I forget which one it is, actually just goes out and tells you this is wrong. Yeah, it's two. There's a literally like an entire page in two that's just, okay, we're going to break it down for you. Where these lines are being drawn don't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, to be entirely frank, we can go further. The kobolds are not tribal. <laughs> they are more centralized than almost any other nation. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point I hadn't even considered. And I I'd like to point out, while this is a Lord Talk on Lamenta, part of the reason why I'm focused on talking about tribal group stuff is that not only are specifically the Sahag and Kobolds like inextricably and deeply tied into Lamensa, but I would just say if you want to study Lamensa in history, maybe more, I mean, we'll talk recent history, but like especially Lamensa's entire history, understanding the relationship between tribal groups and their related nation states is incredibly relevant, especially with you look at how also Lamensa ends up dealing with trade and other groups like the Kakern, right? Yes, so the Kikun are an interesting bunch as well. In fact, they are one of the primary groups, alongside the Sylphs, which is which seems bizarre now. <laughs> the the Kikun are one of the groups, alongside the Sylphs, which seems bizarre now, but in 1.0, they were trading magnates. They are the groups that were originally targeted by the Uldans with the policies that created the Beast Tribe label. And of course, we find a great deal of the quicker in, in Limsa Limsa. And it's sort of implied that they've always been an underclass within Aeosian society. But after the the their exile from Uldar and the, the markets there, and presumably 
to a degree, the Minsons as well, this marginalization just seems to have gotten more profound, and a great deal of them have turned to banditry for it. Yeah, and we talked about this in Still D. I mean, not to talk about Uldah too much, but it's worth remembering that Uldah had long swaths of history where it had good relationships with goblins, the Amalja, the... Like, it, it, it's not always been fraught. It's just really can't hammer that home enough. No, you're absolutely right. The reason... I know we keep going back to this. We do have a video on it, by the way, which you should go and watch. But so the, the reason that the Uldans actually bring this policy into place is that the these these tribes these people are better merchants than them and are, are, are <laughs> pushing syndicate merchants out of the uldan marketplace <laughs> it's true okay i've got some last little nuggets that i think are either fun pieces of information that we just didn't quite get in or worth talking about one of them is could you explain the company of heroes because the msq does in your time when you first get to arr but they're actually quite important, and I feel like a lot of people forget them relatively quickly. Right, so the Company of Heroes seem to be very prominent in Limsa, because Limsa is one of the groups that has the most involvement with Primals, although Ifrit and Garuda are certainly involved. It seems as if Leviathan and Titan, almost but more so Leviathan it seems, are huge parts of the conflict and Limsa needs assistance in fighting them off. So they uh, they contract this mercenary group, uh, the Company of Heroes, which has extremely diverse members, very skilled members, who become at enormous cost to themselves, of course, uh, although presumably also enormous profit, judging by the places we see them in later, become the stand-in for us. They are the ones who are able to fight the Primals, not, not through the Echo, just through sort of graft and dying a lot. Yeah, the way to put it basically is that the tactics for defeating primals before people with the Echo were not so much around, but just weren't an available resource was effectively, okay, we're going to throw a bunch of people at them, right? Most of them are going to get tempered, but it's going to wear them out. Once most of them are dead or tempered, we send the second bigger wave of people in, and then we hope that most of them don't get tempered on their way to killing the primal. Basically, it's hopes and prayers for every fight with a primal. And if you think that's batshit crazy, their quartermaster was Brayflux. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's an excellent point. But so, one, the Company of Heroes have seen some shit. And two, the Company of Heroes that are around, that we know of, you know, the ones that you see, are storied people in their own right. Yes, they're all very skilled, very weathered, probably deeply traumatized people. It's just fascinating to think about the ecological landscape in terms of primal fighting that we have brought about, right? We have entirely <laughs> changed the... Not that people didn't have the Echo before, necessarily, but certainly we have minted that role for ourselves. The company, of course, is dissolved by 2.0. The veterans that are, you know, leftovers of it, we go around, we meet them, we find them, we do Brave Lux's long stuff. Not to get off topic here, but I can I can just imagine all of them settling down after fighting a primal, and like ninety percent of their friends are dead, and they open up like their lunch boxes, and it's just cheese. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I'm I'm pretty sure you're just quoting a short story that was definitely written by someone official and not in our heads. <laughs> so moving on from dying in terrible ways, what about the lung rot and tropical disease that we see pop up multiple times throughout the story? Even healthier, the leader, that's referenced in 5.4 and even in the, the Island Sanctuary questline. Yes, yes. So, Vilbrand's climate is a really interesting topic, actually. So parts of it are jungles, are tropical jungles. Other parts seem to be almost like southern Spanish grassland type vibes. It, 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 it's a very diverse climate. But certainly, several of the individuals that we hear about, the first admiral of Limsa is stated to have died from lung rot, actually. Or probably died from lung rot. <laughs> you never know with those pirates. No, you don't. But of course, like you said, the leader of the second most powerful crew has lung rot and is in the process of not doing so great with that. But I, I also think it's sort of an allusion to scurvy, right? Uh, not that it's actually yeah. analogous to scurvy, but sort of pirate diseases. Yeah, tropical diseases, even just like malaria and, and all sorts of things. It could be referencing any number of historical ailments, but it's funny you mentioned scurvy because one of the things that we get in Encyclopedia Heroes of Volume 1 is that Lenosia was actually named after a loadsman who died of scurvy, <laughs> which 
is one uh, really appropriate that a man who died of scurvy is responsible for the name of the uh, <laughs> of Lunopsia. <laughs> but beyond that, why don't we talk about names as a whole? Because Lunosia is not a Rogadin name, but clearly it was would have been one of the men on the ship. We know that there were Elizin on the ship, which is weird because the Ersalanti aren't said to be a mixed group. It's mostly just said to be Rogadin. Did, did the Gladian come from Dravania? Like, the naming structures are interesting because even Limsa Lamensa itself is not Rogadin. It's not Ersalanti in, in nature. Right, exactly. And, and the names of the Elizin that were there, they, they seem to be quite specifically Eorzean Elizin names. They're French. <laughs> they're, they're French people, goddammit. And of course, La would be an allusion to French, of course, in Lenosha, if, if you were to think of it that way. Jean de Nouvelle and Guy Le Thong Thagran are the navigators of, of the Gladian. And these are very Eorzean Elizabeth. We know they're Elizabeth, but they're very Eorzean Elizabeth names specifically. But I would have to imagine, you know, they could have picked them up. They would have sailed down the coast from Dravania, presumably. So they could have picked them up there. Yeah, I guess the fact that they're helmsmen, though, means that they would have been sailing the ship in a pretty important role, which makes me assume that they had experience at that occupation. So the impression that I get of the crew that cl crashes the Gladian is that, well, <laughs> that kind of flops, right? <laughs> they come over because they tried to uh, perform a coup back in Airslaint and failed, and they crash their ship. We know that their, their navigators are not natives of their group. They seem like a motley crew. Maybe that's a good way to put it. A very motley crew. And it makes sense that they would outsource. Of course, pirate ship compositions, even Viking crew compositions in certain contexts, were hugely diverse thanks to the trade and the travel that they engaged in. So I'm not necessarily surprised by it, but it is interesting. I, I almost wonder if there's a Charlian connection, I have to admit, or a proto Charlian. Okay, yeah, because they come about because of the, the early, the fifth astral. That would make the most logical sense. Yeah, I, I think that that, uh, that is definitely the pitch I'd be going with for now. And also for anyone who wants to feel dumb, just because apparently I and a lot of other people did not realize this until a certain ways into playing the game, but Nosia is an anagram for oceans. So it's also just the oceans. <laughs> so... As kind of a final topic, which maybe we should have hit on earlier, but maybe it's actually appropriate to go on out. With the Gladian Accord, piracy was ended by Merlwib, but there was still privateering. And that works, I mean, while the Garlean army still exists, maybe in current days are more questionable. But I guess the twofold thing I have is the distinction between privacy and privateering. And maybe, I guess, broadly as an ethos for all of Limsa, why piracy? So... I'll, I'll cover, as a British person, I'll cover piracy, <laughs> piracy versus privateering, first of all, as a as sort of a historical national pastime. <laughs> piracy is quite literally just the act of banditry by the sea. Uh, and it doesn't have to be ship on ship. You know, piracy can include raids on the coast and even up rivers. Essentially, privateering is just historically Western government sponsored because <laughs> North African nations and, and uh, Balkan nations and even uh, Southeast Asian nations have been doing privateering for thousands of years. But the British coined the term privateering to apply to government-sponsored piracy to legitimize it. But it is just piracy that is backed by or legitimized by a government. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's worth pointing out, within the confines of 14, one of the distinctions is that is the sponsorship, but also the direction of, right? So... When it comes to Limsa, the privateering was allowed to, hey, go crazy on Garlean ships because that serves our function and also keeps you from annoying our neighbors. And I think that's one of the other really important facets. Partially also why 5.4 happens when 5.4 happens. Because let's say there's certain culminations coming to a head and we want to try to get ahead of those problems before they end up popping up. What happens when you're, the people you're directing to privateer are maybe no longer in the equation? Well, I'll tell you what happened historically. You kill the privateers. <laughs> so in this context, it makes a lot of sense that they privateered, right? If they continue preying on other Eorzean nations, then the alliance will crumble within moments. If they go against Thavnair, they lose enormous amounts of their trade. Other targets probably aren't quite as valuable. And there's the fact that a huge majority of the world's coastline is just all owned by Garlemald, so you're just allowed to go there and do that. But nowadays, obviously with the fall or pseudo fall of Garlemald, it's it's interesting. The direction that is most obvious outside of, you know, uh, holdout legion areas would be the New World. Yeah. With with the fall of Garlemald. Now, all of that 
impetus has to go somewhere. All of those resources, that investment, those people with big axes who want to hit things with them, they have to go to the new world or Mericidia. They have to be put to some function. Like, even if it's just adventuring, which is also another thing we get, that there's a lot of promotion of adventuring in order to be a relief valve for some of that impetus. Although I do also love that basically we get what the monetary replacement for that is to land lease islands <laughs> for island sanctuary. <laughs> like, straight up, that's <laughs> the argument is that that's their plan. It's like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to lease these islands to crazy to, to people who want to have island sanctuaries and stuff and make a bunch of passive income off that. Yeah, yeah, but I think if we were to see a living world, obviously the budget isn't there to do a cataclysm style expansion every patch. We can't change the maps every time. We shouldn't either. Seeing that already, even in the grips of that, the height of War with Gala Mold, the Limitsons were already encouraging people to trade in their swords for plowshares, to go into farming, to go into fishing, stuff like that, to go into a defense force, a land based defense force. I'm sure they're going to direct a lot of individuals away from that life onto the island or onto trade ships. And if we were to see that in play out in real time, I'm sure that we'd see, you know, increased industrialization and agriculture of Vilbrand. So speaking of farming, how did the Seven Thumbrow Calamity affect Vilbrand as a whole? Because it seemed to really have messed up the land in certain parts, especially if you compare it to the 1.0 map. So I, I think the most dramatic example of this, and this isn't the natural world, but so the Aether is volatile and the Lamentons put a big tower to use the light tower and filled it with Aether. They have this huge reservoir for it and it gets hit by a shard of Dalamud and it just goes boom <laughs> and causes all of the enormous destruction that you see in Fire of Sirius. More than that, you see large amounts of the ocean itself crystallized and making portions of the inland just completely barren, which then the Sahagin in large part take over. You see great areas of the inland also corrupted by this sort of etheric discharge. And you even have certain peninsulas that are just gone, just like completely sunk beneath the sea. Yeah, the, the enormous tidal waves. It, it's nowhere near the calamity of water level, but certainly great, great deals of the, the land was swept away, just as the Sahagin spawning grounds were swept away. And then they go for Limps and Limsa. A good deal of Vilbrand is swept away, or at least comparatively. I imagine that on an island like Vilbrand, it doesn't take much being swept away for it to be a good deal being swept away. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Okay, so final question, just as a bookend. Why piracy? I think it just makes the most sense. Historically, the fact that they, they came over from a piratical society in the sea wolves who, who are very much formed around raiding and going viking but also their position any coastal nation that is hugely important in trade is going to have pirates you know the roman empire had pirates in liguria to their immediate west and in illyria to their immediate east the christian states and the north african muslim states of the middle ages sponsored piracy Myanmar, anywhere that you go, anywhere that huge amounts of trade flows, there's piracy. And it makes sense that if you're a, a civilization founded initially by pirates, you capitalize on that, you, you lean into it, especially when your origins are specifically anti-authority. Anti it makes sense to go for that rather than sort of a codified trader nation, I suppose. Yeah, do what you know. So then final question, part B, do you think Limsa will be able to secure a better future and, you know, a forward-looking one maybe better than the past that it's had? I do. The only thing that I'd like to see is stepping on Oldar's toes. <laughs> they're both <laughs> they're both mineral superpowers, especially nowadays that the kobolds are bought under. They're both major contenders for the trade of the East. Maybe Limsa has a lock on the New World uh, and the South Sea Islands, although I would debate that last one, but there's a great deal of reason for them to have conflict. Uh, you know, I could see down the line 200 years, a war breaking up between the two. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's my worry. Is that I think that the next 50 years, I'm not worried about, but the next 200, the dragons say it well, you know, the human lives are short and human memory is shorter. The level to which we engage with a new world in the future will be fascinating. And I'm deeply hopeful that if Merwib maybe even steps down from the Admiralty, she'll have a big part to play in that.
as her history is entwined with it. If the maelstrom declines, as it logically probably would in the wake of the fall of Gallimold, I could see Bill Wibb becoming a fourth pirate, fourth of the major pirate factions and leading the League of the Lost Bastards again. That would be really cool. I'd like to see that as sort of a rival to Carvalain and the, the Sirens and the bloody group. Another sort of historical parallel that just occurred to me is, so one of the major benefits for the European powers of discovering the Americas was the ability to engage in trade without having to access the Eastern Mediterranean, without having to go through Ottoman-controlled seas. Now, of course, there are cultural ties between Uldar and the Ottomans. The continued influence of Limsa in the New World could lead to a Nuldan collapse. It could lead into a, lead into a very severe economic decline amongst the uh, Uldan society. Ooh, that's an interesting point because of how reliant they are on trade with Limsa. But then again, the widening of the broader world, like between Thavnair, Hingashi, Doma, there's also new avenues for them. If Limsa goes west, it's very likely that Ilda could further go east. I mean, not to mention all of the bounty being accessible to them. Yeah, that's definitely true. I just wonder. I, I wonder how those trade routes are going to change and how much they're going to change the landscape of Eorzea. Which is exactly why you come to our lore talks. With that <laughs> said, Naniri, we should probably wrap it up here. I feel like I could talk endlessly, but I know that also, A, having talked with you for five hours before, that is a nightmare to edit. And two, <laughs> I know that it's very late for you, so I want you to get to sleep, some sleep. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll dream dreams of burly Rogadin girl pirates. Oh, uh, you'll never disappoint. <laughs> So, to everyone listening, thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to support us, you can go over to our Patreon, where you can give us a couple of dollars. It goes a long way to making this whole thing supportable and makes it easier to schedule time with an Aniri, because then we don't have to worry about certain things. Beyond that, you can also find our streams. We stream every Monday and Tuesday, typically, where we do the MSQ replay. Me and Aniri also stream. We're currently playing through all the Final Fantasy games on Thursdays. And beyond that, uh, we just love it when you engage with us, whether it be in the comments, whether even off honestly, if you say, hey, I love listening to this, it makes my day. I cannot tell you how in revitalizing and invigorating that is. Or if you have a point about, oh, here's this really cool little tidbit or a bit of lore, feel free to comment that as well. Yeah, constructive criticism is very useful. And yeah, like any engagement from y'all is, is a huge boon to all of us. We will have to figure out what we'll do next time. I'm sure people will leave comments down below for that, for the topic that they're most interested in. Beyond that, though, I've been Elio Forcheron. And I've been Neneri Neri. And we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Hey, all. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, praise the 12 by giving it a like and comment or by subscribing. It goes a long way to helping the channel. Don't forget, new videos every week, and if you want to engage with us further, why not check out our Discord and Patreon in the link below and become a part of our community. With that said, see you around, fellow Archons.